Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. I feel the awesome presence of the Lord in this place today. And I am excited about what God is doing in this city and in this great church. I am humbled and privileged and honored to be in this church again. But I am completed this time because my wife and my children are with me. Last time I was just a grumpy evangelist coming solo. And today I am a complete and happy man to have my family with me today. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Psalms 27 and 1. And we're going to read two uh, separate portions of Scripture. Please don't worry, that doesn't mean that I'm going to preach twice as long as I normally would. We are going to go to two separate portions of Scripture, Psalms 27, and then we'll read that and we'll skip down to Isaiah 54. And uh, while you're turning there, I just want to take a moment and reiterate what I said in Sunday school class this morning. Uh, I believe that you have one of the greatest pastors in all of the United States. Praise God. And pastor's wives. And I know that your pastor wouldn't be what he is without a great wife behind him. Working, and she works so very hard. And, uh, and they are some of the kindest, most godly people. You know, there are many people that claim to be Christians. But when you're close to them, you don't feel like they're Christians. But uh, of all the compliments, I could talk about uh, just the anointing that your pastor has. I could talk about his intelligence and, and, uh, and how well known he is all across the country. But, but I think the single greatest compliment that I could make is that he is indeed a Christian, and he lives what he believes, and he lives what he teaches, and he is who he says he is. And I am so honored and privileged to know you, and uh, we love them so. And they have sown seeds in our lives, and, uh, and we are better people for knowing them. And I know you are as well. Amen. So it's a privilege to be here today. I told him I was humbled to teach with him right there because I would I could just sit and listen to him teach and preach for days. Just we could just have a, a 21 day revival where Pastor Walter just taught and preached. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a great idea? I may be in the spirit, I don't know. Some of y'all look like you're gonna pass out right now, but but I know you love your pastor. Make sure you let him know it too. Sometimes we think we've told him they don't, they don't realize it. Praise God. If you have a great pastor, you are blessed indeed. Okay. Psalms 27 and 1. If you have that, just kind of wave your hand at me and let me know. And I'm going to feel my liberty and just preach what I feel today. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion, in the secret of His tabernacle shall He hide me. He shall set me on a rock. Now my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Isaiah 54 and 16. If you could turn with me there very quickly. Behold, someone said, look, I have created the smith. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire. And that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. But I like verse number 17. And this is where we're going to draw our text from today. No weapon that is formed against thee <laughs> shall prosper. Oh, I, I wish someone would just read that out loud with me right now. No weapon that is formed against thee. Shall now, I wish someone that really believed it, I, if you really believe it, I wish you would read it like you really believe it. No weapon 
that is formed against me. Shall I I, we found about 60% and there's still some of you. Your faith is just, it's tugging up. Your faith wants to well up. But it's, it's just being the flesh and the cares of the world. It's stomping your faith. I wish you'd shake your fist in the devil's face right now. And say, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Put your Bibles down, throw up your hands, lift up your voice, and why don't you give God high praise? If you're going through a trial, why don't you praise Him? If you're walking through a valley, why don't you shout hallelujah? In the mighty name of Jesus, we lift up your name above every name. We lift up your name above all the cares of the world, God. We lift up your name in this place. You are great and mighty and awesome, God. I lift up your name above every sickness, above every disease, above financial turmoil, God. Above doubt, above fear, God. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God. I'd like to preach with the help of the Lord for just a little while this morning. I'm going to rip the title from a song. No matter the weapon, we win. No matter the weapon, we win. Look at your neighbor and say, we win as you're seated today. This scripture... In Isaiah chapter 54 and verse number 17 comes with, as so many scriptures often do in the word of God, comes with bad news and then attached to that bad news is some really good news. The good news is that no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And then there's a caveat there if you read it very carefully and many people Ignore the caveat because there's a little word uh, there that tells us a little sentence that says that, that no weapon shall prosper against thee. This is the heritage. In other words, this promise is exclusively for the servants of the Lord. Can you say praise God if you're a servant of the Lord today? And so this is an exclusive promise for God's people. How many know that when you were grafted into the body of Christ that there was a benefit package that came with your membership? Praise the Lord. One of those all-inclusive promises that we see from the Word of God when, Peter, when Jesus spoke to Peter and said, Upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. That was a promise for me and for you today. Aren't you glad to be a part of the church of the living God? And so God has designed some promises for us. And we know that we can stand on the promises of God. How many have spent your life standing on the promises of God? It's never too late to claim His promises. But the bad news that's kind of insinuated in this scripture is that even though no weapon that's formed against you will prosper... There are going to be some weapons formed against you. Can you say, oh no? There are going to be trials tailored specifically and designed specifically for your spiritual and sometimes even your physical death. Weapons that are designed to penetrate even your strongest defenses. Temptations tailored to weaken your resolve and trip you in your walk with God. People sometimes are strategically placed in your life by the enemy to produce failure. But it's important to know that these attacks do not, will not, and cannot come from the throne of God. These attacks come straight from the gates of hell. And it's high time for the church to recognize that there is an enemy of your soul and he's roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, looking for a weakness in your armor. But I came to remind you that you don't have to live in fear of failure and you don't have to tremble at the mention of the name of Satan. But you have a name that is more powerful than any demon in hell. Because at the mention, he's a combo yakaha. Of the name of Jesus, every demon in hell begins to tremble. Every fortress of the enemy begins. 
about to get in some spiritual territory that's going to cause some problems. I need to be careful. I don't know how much trouble you want me to stir up, Pastor, but let me just tell you. You may be seated. I'm going to get you standing up in just a minute. But let me just tell you, the Bible teaches us, and we know and understand. I was praying the other day in our church prayer room, and, and there was a group there, and I began to feel an impression in my spirit uh, in our city. And I'm feeling it right now, the same impression that I felt in prayer. Did you know that the Bible seems to teach us that there are spiritual strongholds yes. that begin to set themselves up in specific regions? And yes. in the United States, we, we regions by cities and counties and states. But I believe that specific cities get uh, sometimes are, have strongholds. Spiritual demonic strongholds that are entrenched in those cities. And, and I feel like I'm bumping up against the strong men of this city right now. But I want you to know that this church has more power in one moment in an altar of God. One prayer warrior has more power in their prayer than all the demons combined. Than every bar Than every place of congregation. The church of the living God. And they're looking for a moment of weakness. And sir, they're 
They're waiting to see what you're going to do tonight on the internet. And the enemy is waiting to see what you're going to mess with. What you're going to fiddle with and play with. And he's going to look for that weakness in your heart. And he's forming and fashioning a weapon right now. Designed specifically for you. You need to know. He's concerned with your soul. He wants to cause spiritual death in your life. Oh, but preacher, I don't like that. I, I need to warn you because you need to know. You say, I just struggle, struggle with temptation. I, I pray and I leave and I have revival. And then I leave and I just can't seem to get the victory. I'm going to tell you why. Because there are weapons being formed against you. I'm going to tell you how to overcome it before we leave this place today. But I want you to understand that when Job went through his trial. We see that Job's trials were specifically designed for him. Uh -huh. it and we also see that the trials that Job went through were not designed by God. But remember the story from Job chapter 1. But Job was such a righteous man. And he was such a godly man. I want you to know when you get on the verge of something awesome, that's when the weapon's going to be formed. In fact, he was such a righteous man that, and he had he had the favor of God. So strong. how many want the favor of God in your life? We hear a lot of preaching about that today, don't we? That'll make us feel good, won't it? But the favor of God was on Job's life. And because, because, someone said because. Because he had the favor of God in his life, when Satan, and I don't, we don't have time to go through all this, but Satan came into the throne room of God. Do you remember the story? And he said, he began, they had a conversation. This just blows my mind. I don't understand all the implications here. But God literally began to brag. Yes, come on. How many want God to brag about you? You may not want God to brag on you. Because when God started bragging on his servant Job, he said this. Have you considered my servant Job? How he's a righteous man. There's none like him in all the earth. And Satan said, oh boy, you just think there's no one like him in all the earth. You wait till I can't start messing with his finances. You wait till I bring a little sickness in his life. You just think those Pentecostals in Albany, Georgia are excitable, God. You just wait till I, I put a little financial stress on them. And I'll shut that revival down. I say, devil, that won't work. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Righteous Lord, but, but you just wait until I, I start putting a little turmoil in his life and he'll curse you to your face, God. And, and Job's trials came from the mind of Satan. But I want you to notice, sickness came on him. Now, I know life just happens. I know life, the fiery trials of life, something that's not always the devil. We don't look for a demon behind between every door stop. But there are times when revival starts rumbling where it can be a demonically backed attack. And I can't, oh. So we see that even though Satan was, was coming against Job's body, his desire was not to take Job's life. Because he didn't want to take his life until he took a soul. So we need to understand today that the enemy is more concerned with your soul than he is with your body. And so the weapons of Satan's warfare are designed to destroy your walk with God. That's why you can see people sometimes prospering who are so far away from God because Satan's not concerned with them. He's already got them covered. But if he can trip up a child of God, then that is his single most important goal in his mind. So we have every one of us that's in this service today. I'm scared. I knew I was going to take your shout away, but I, I'm doing what the Lord told me today. You came in today. And by walking in these doors, now some of you didn't. Some of you came and you made up your mind. You weren't going to worship for nothing. You weren't going to feel God for nothing. And if you came in that way, you don't have to worry about anything I'm saying. But if you came in and you came ready to worship God and you came to do something in the spirit and you've made up your mind you're going to serve God and you're not playing games anymore, then you came at a target. like this, but, but I, I'm going to turn it around, I promise. Now, I'm going to warn you, this is a, a kind of a manly illustration. And I have to be careful because I know there's military men here. And so I'm going to step into military territory 
And I am not a military man. And so I, I, I love it. I, I wish I was. They wouldn't take me because of my heart. But the deal is, some of you ladies are just going to have to pretend like you enjoy this illustration. I'm sorry. There are, they formed, y'all could correct me on the date. I won't even give the date in case it's wrong. But they formed a weapon called an HSM, or Heat Seeking Missiles, changed the way warfare is fought. They were developed to lock onto specific targets, and, and, uh, and they did this by sensing the heat that was emanating from a target. And so there was a, my understanding is there's a computer chip that's in these missiles, and, and that the computer chip will, will sense the heat, and they lock it onto a general location, and then rather than just just going to that entire region, it'll lock in where the heat is coming from. And it'll, it's designed to lock in. And so I, I was even reading the other day, and I'm really getting uh, out, of, out of my comfort zone here, but I was reading that they have finished. It's just too expensive for them to mass market it. They have bullets, right? Ladies, I'm so sorry. They have bullets right now, that little gigantic uh, bullets that are, are made for like a sniper rifle, that they can put a chip in it. And the chip will cause it to, to lock onto a specific target. They can even slip something onto someone, onto their person. And then that chip will sense the heat and the computerized mechanisms of that person. And they could, they could launch a bullet from miles and miles away. And the bullet would literally be able to change its course and find its intended target. Preacher, where are you going with all this? Let me tell you, the devil has his own heat-seeking weapons. And he is looking for a believer's heart. He's looking someone for someone who has the fire of the Holy Spirit burning brightly in their life. Don't you ever doubt it. He wants to lock onto you right now today. His weapons are designed to hone into those who are, are full of faith and whose hearts burn with zealousness for God. I remember when I began to, to finally launch out in ministry and, and people say often, people will come and say, uh, Brother French, I, I wish that I could travel the country and preach like you did. And I tell him, you be careful what you wish for. Because whenever God calls you to something, uh, you will become a, a target for the enemy. When I first began sensing that uh, Sister French and I were going to travel full time, I was sitting in my office in Natchez, Mississippi. I was an assistant pastor there. And there were things going on. And we were taking a very specific stand for righteousness and truth. And as we did, it was about midnight. And it was my custom, it was my routine to study on Saturday nights till uh, well after midnight for the next day. And people, everybody knew that. And my office faced the road. There was a main road that went right by the office, at kind of a highway. And, and my back was to that main road. My desk kind of faced away and then my, the back of my head was facing that road. And I'll never forget, the clock struck almost exactly midnight and I heard a loud boom. That, that sounded like a gunshot, but in my mind, I, I wasn't expecting a gunshot, so I, I thought that uh, this, is probably a, uh, this is probably a car, a tire having a blowout on the street. And then I felt, have you ever been, anybody got enough Holy Ghost in them that, that you sense something in the spirit's not right? And as I did, I leaned down, and, and, I, and we found out later there was a giant 45 slug hole in my office, just missed my head. By, by just, just inches. And I realized in that moment as I went down to the ground and I realized what was happening. That gunfire was going on. And I began, that, that scripture came to me. It was quickened in my mind. And I felt God speaking to me saying, I, I know you're going through it right now. But I want you to remember, no weapon that is formed against me is going to prosper. I know this is talking specifically about spiritual warfare. Because how many know we wrestle not against flesh and blood? But in that moment, I knew that in that specific moment, this was not just a physical attack, but there was a spiritual aspect. It was a physical bullet and a physical gun and a physical enemy, but he was being pulled by the power of hell. And I began to pray with authority. I'm telling you, no weapon going to against you. Goliath was almost 10 feet tall. Even without his weapons, he was a scary guy. He was the Philistines' ultimate warrior. Yeah. 
1 Samuel chapter 17 takes four entire verses describing Goliath. That's an unprecedented thing in Scripture. Three of those verses describe his weapons. His armor was tailored to his size and his strength. The staff of his spear, the Bible says, was like a weaver's beam. The spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. Just for the word of God to take any time at all describing this. The word of God could have, could have let us know a little bit more about what it was like in Genesis 1-1 when God spoke creation into existence. But God said, no, I'm going to spend a little time and describe the size of Goliath and, and the weapons of his warfare. He had an armor bearer that walked out before him into battle. One historian wrote that Goliath would have been carrying on his person all of the swords that he had collected from fallen enemies. Slain warriors that he had murdered in battle. He, he took their swords from them. And this was the custom of the Philistine warriors. And he would have had them on him. And the reason he wore those weapons was to let anyone who was fighting him know. These are the swords of people who have fallen against me in battle. It was designed to intimidate the enemy. They were trophies designed to cause fear in the hearts of men. Goliath had been groomed all of his life to be the weapon that would finally defeat Zion. They tried to convince young David that he needed armor, that he needed to fight like everyone else would fight him. And, and at least take a sword, at least get a spear, get, get something, at least David, take a shield. Couldn't you at least take a shield, David? And, and he began to say no. And we see that when David finally stood face to face with Goliath, we know the story from Sunday school. All he held in his hand was a slingshot and a few stones. Now, I don't know about you, but I would have been scared to fight Goliath with a handgun and him with no weapon at all. And I certainly would have found it a way for me to fight him with the shield. I mean, don't you think? I would have at least said, I, I would have at least found somebody with a little courage in the camp of Zion that, that would grab a great big shield and run out with me and help me, help me dodge the, the, the spear and so forth. But, but David came to him with nothing but a stone and a slingshot. And as Goliath hurled insults and threats, David said, Today everyone here is going to know that the Lord saveth not with swords and spears, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Praise God. How many know God doesn't need to fight with the weapons of the enemy? God doesn't need dishonesty and hatred, and he doesn't need to stir up turmoil and bitterness in your heart. But the weapons of our warfare are love, joy, peace, and righteousness and long suffering in the Holy Ghost. It's prayer and fasting and praise and worship for the glory of God. God can do more with some stones in the hands of a believer than the enemy can do with spears and swords. Pharaoh's attack with armies and chariots, but God uses the wind and the sea. The Midianites come with armies and warriors, but God sends a few men with pitchers and trumpets. Satan came to Jesus in the wilderness with lies and temptations, but all that Jesus needed was the pure word of God to get the victory over the enemy. I want you to know that we can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. David said, you come to me with the sword and spear and shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord. As the musicians come, I'm closing. When David killed Goliath, there he stood. I've often asked myself, why did he not have a shield? The Lord answered my question in Psalms 22 when David later wrote, But thou, O God, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. I wonder today if you would stand and let the Lord be your shield. Let God be your armor bearer. Let him be your safe harbor. Let him be the fortress that you can run into and find rest. Let me pause and just remind you in closing that whatever you need, you can find in Jesus. In the Old Testament, he was Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Jehovah Rafika, the Lord my healer. 
Jehovah Shalom, the Lord your peace. Jehovah Pishkano, the Lord your righteousness. Jehovah Shama, the Lord is present. Do you feel him in this place? Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord our sanctifier. Then a prophet came along on a star studded night and said, One day you're not going to have to remember Jehovah Nisi, Rafika, Pishkano, Shama, or Mekadesh. One day there's coming a Savior, and it's all going to be encompassed in his name. And I can hear an angel on a star studded night say, Mary, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, I wish someone could get excited about the name of Jesus. Jesus is the first and the last. He's the son of Israel. He's the rock my salvation. He's a mighty fortress. David said he's my shepherd in the time of trouble. He's your restorer. He is your wisdom. He's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. He's the precious rose of Sharon. The bride and glory of star. The lily of the valley. He's all together lovely. He's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Some call him wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God in Christ. The Prince of Peace. He is the light of the world. He is the root of Jesse. He's the fairest of 10,000. The spotless lamb. He's the advocate. He's our high priest. And he's our ever-present help in the time of trouble. Clap your hands to the Lord. I'm about to set you loose on the devil tonight. I want to open up these altars in just a minute. And when I open them, I want you to come running like you're storming the gates of hell. And you know how you're going to get the victory? You're going to get the victory with your mouth. You're going to open up your mouth and you're going to call on the name of Jesus. If you're going through a trial, I want you to open up your mouth and call on the name of Jesus. And I want you to do more than ask Him for help. It's okay. I want you to ask Him for help. But when you're done with that, I want you to start praising Him. I want you to give Him the victory. I want you to give Him the worship that He deserves. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to pray a prayer of faith over us right now. If you need the Holy Ghost, God's going to fill you as you come to this altar. Dear Lord Jesus, right now, I claim it, God. I feel the rumblings of revival in this church, Lord. And I pray that, God, you would place a hedge of protection around every believer. That you would give them the faith and the strength. And you would give them the power to overcome every weapon that the enemy is forming against them right now. And we claim and we stand authoritatively on your promise uh, that no weapon formed against my brothers and sisters is going to prosper. And we believe you for it. And what we're going to do right now, God, is we're going to give you the praise that you so richly deserve. I'm opening up this altar right now. If you're going through a trial, I don't want you to hold back. I want you to run to this altar. 